Hello, everyone, and welcome to our field day. Uh, today, we're going to talk about um, biosecurity and the secure beef supply plan. So we'll go ahead and get started here. So we're going to talk about how to protect your cattle herd from diseases and uh, try to make this as practical as possible. So I'm Christine Navarre. I'm the Extension Veterinarian with the LSU um, Ag Center. I do want to thank um, Dr. Julia Herman. She um, was a, a partner in putting this presentation together and we, we've used it for several groups. Um, she's the Beef Cattle Specialist uh, Veterinarian with the National uh, Cattlemen's uh, Beef Association and and works really closely with the Beef Quality Assurance uh, Program. So a couple of definitions as we, we talk through this. So technically speaking, biosecurity is actually trying to keep diseases out of our herds that we don't already have. And that could be diseases that are already here in the US, but that also applies to foreign animal diseases. Biocontainment is really about keeping diseases that we already have on the ranch from spreading. So let's say calf diarrhea or pneumonia. And in all honesty, in all honesty, we really kind of lump these together and just say biosecurity because a lot of the things we do to, to keep diseases out and from spreading um, overlap. So we kind of simplify them down and um, talk about them all together. But there are really two categories of diseases that we have to think about. So there are diseases that are short lived where we, um, you know, respiratory disease. So the animals either get over it or they, they don't. And in that case, uh, quarantine works. But then we have diseases where we have carrier animals. So anaplasmosis, BBD, yonis, trichomoniasis are examples of those where if we buy an animal with one of those diseases, even if we quarantine it for 30 days, it's still gonna have that disease because it's a carrier, it's a lifelong carrier. And so to keep those diseases out, we're gonna have to run some tests and, and your veterinarian is the best person to help you figure out where those animals are coming from and what we need to test um, for. And what we have to do is is find a balance between what's necessary and practical for every day. So we have to do business. We have to buy and sell cattle. That comes with a risk um, and it, it depends on your business model. But then we have to be prepared in case we get some type of foreign animal um, disease in this country. And we need to know how we're gonna step things up. It's the things that we may not do on an everyday basis, but we need to be ready just in case we get something like uh, COVID-19, you know, come into the cattle uh, business, uh, something like foot and mouth disease. So biosecurity protocols, they take some time to develop, but they're really not that uh, complicated. And it really is the cheap and most effective means of disease control. We don't have vaccinations for every disease out there. And a lot of our vaccines are not really great at keeping diseases out. They're, they're okay at controlling diseases once we have them, but that's not uh, always a, a good economic um, outcome. And so we, you know, again, uh, need to think about what we need to do on a daily basis to prevent introduction and spread of diseases. And then also uh, what we're gonna do if um, a foreign animal disease should enter the, the US. So now's the time to think about those things. We are, um, as veterinarians, we are hearing that indemnity, should we get a foreign animal disease outbreak, that indemnity and stop movement uh, orders, uh, whether or not you can move cattle or not after stop movement may be tied to having a written biosecurity plan. And so uh, it's a good idea. It's, it makes good business sense to have those biosecurity plans on a day-to-day -day basis but it also makes good sense um, from a pr preparation standpoint, because again, we just don't know uh, when, when um, one of those foreign animal diseases is gonna enter the US. So we need to kind of break herds up into risk categories and there's a lot of overlap here, but uh, in general, uh, we talk about a closed herd. That is very, very rare actually, because for the most part, people are, eventually going to buy some replacement uh, females and we're talking cow calf operations here mostly uh, you know maybe if you only introduce a bull every once in a while but uh, you know really no animal re-entry so you're not showing animals no fence line contact with other herds 
uh, introduced animals have a, a known health if you if you do buy only a bull and then they are quarantined and, and tested and your risk here is going to be very low. A modified open herd, so this is mo much more common. This is what we have um, for the most part. And so that's gonna be limited introductions. You have your, your base cow herd, uh, you may um, buy some replacement heifers, you're, you're buying bulls, you may have some show animals, uh, you, you know, fence line contact with other herds of, of similar risk. So you're not, um, you know, a, don't have a, a nice cow herd across the, fence from some rope and steers, but, you know, from somebody who has a very similar um, risk profile. And, you know, you're still going to introduce animals with a known health background and that are tested um, for those diseases that um, are determined by your um, herd veterinarian. And then we're, again, quarantining new um, arrivals. So your, your risk there is, is moderate. It doesn't mean that you're never going to introduce a disease. And unfortunately, some of our diseases, the testing is not exact but it's better than not testing at all. And then an open herd is, you know, routine purchase, re-entry and movement of animals. This might be, a, you know, a, a stalker operation where you're buying high-risk cattle from multiple sources, um, direct commingling of introduced animals with herd animals, uh, introduced animals of unknown health background, uh, you know, fence line contact with high risk, you know, at a feedlot, you might have, you know, cattle in the in a pen, but if they have nose to nose contact across the, the fence, then that's um, that's a risk. So the risk there is much higher than the the other two. And if we think about, well, how do I prevent, you know, BVD from getting my, in my herd? How do I prevent respiratory disease? How do I prevent trick? If we think it, about it on a disease to disease basis, it gets pretty complicated because there are so many diseases out there, the possibilities are endless, but there are really only a handful of ways that diseases are transmitted. And so if we think about, okay, I need to stop aerosol transmission, then I stop transmission of all the diseases that have, that are transmitted through the aerosol route. That would be, you know, on the human side, again, COVID-19 is one of those aerosolized um, viruses. The, the spread of disease agents, so it's animal to animal, and at the, it, towards the end of this, we're gonna talk about animal to human because that's also an important thing that we, we need to constantly kind of have in the back of our mind. So we have aerosol, direct contact, fomite, oral, vector-borne, um, and then zoonotic. So again, if we understand those routes of transmission, that's how we gain um, control over uh, these diseases, and we're going to identify those risk areas and then design protocols to minimize that uh, transmission. And fortunately, again, many of the recommendations also protect against multiple modes of transmission. So if I'm going to have a quarantine area and it's, um, I have a, a fence line and there's no nose to nose contact between groups, let's say I have a lane fenced off, um, and those cattle can't touch each other, they can't breathe on each other, then we've, we've stopped a, a couple of um, ways of, of diseases being transmitted. So aerosol, those are droplets in the air. Um, this is really common for respiratory um, pneumonia, um, bugs, viruses, and, and bacteria um, is, is something we commonly um, see. Uh, direct contact, so that might be with a direct contact with another animal or direct contact with the environment. So, you know, any of the bodily fluids uh, can spread diseases um, and those can get in through open wounds, mucous membranes, they can sometimes get in through intact skin. Reproductive transmission would be um, an example of that. Trichomoniasis is a good example. Um, fomites, so we wanna make sure that we're not spreading diseases. So needles, not changing needles is a, is a a uh, really uh, fast way of spreading things like anaplasmosis, bovine leukemia virus. But we have to think also about grooming equipment, vehicles, trailers, um, things, you know, front end loader. Are we using the front end loader to, you know, scrape manure and as a, a feed, um, a way to get feed to, to cattle. Um, oral transmission is really consumption of contaminated feed or water. And, um, you know, so diseases, uh, foot and mouth disease, obviously, again, and then yoni salmonella can be spread um, through uh, contaminated feed, water, or, um, you know, environment. Vector transmission, so we have a lot of vector-borne 
um, problems here in the, in the south. We have ticks, we have flies, and they can either be a mechanical vector where they um, just simply pick up the blood and carry it, or biological vectors is where the, the organism actually gets in the tick. Anaplasmosis is a, an example of that. The um, tick picks up the anaplasmosis and the an anaplasmosis actually multiplies in the tick and then that tick goes to another animal and then transmits that. So some general recommendations, think about increasing distance between animal groups. So again, a, a lane fenced off between pastures. So for example, at our house, we have a, a ditch um, that's fenced off and we've got about you know, 15 feet of space um, between those pastures. And when we were showing cattle, we kept our show cattle on one side and we, we kept our cow herd, um, breeding, breeding herd on the, on the other side. Uh, quarantine area, same thing. We, we want to make sure that, um, you know, that area is, is fenced off. It doesn't necessarily need to be a barn. So, you know, you just want, in fact, outside is better because if there are diseases, the, the sunlight, and the rain can help, you know, wash and kill those. Um, you do, you know, want to make sure you have shade and water and things, but um, a, a good quarantine area outside, just a, a separate pasture is, is what you want to think about. Plus or minus isolating sick animals. So if, if it depends on the disease, and this is where your veterinarian uh, that knows your operation can really help out and whether or not you're going to isolate sick animals. And sometimes it depends on what it is. If, it, if it's respire, if you've got one that has pneumonia and all of the other animals have already been exposed, it doesn't really necessarily make sense to isolate one animal. And when you isolate an animal away from its herd mates, that's an extra stressor. So those are things that we have to kind of balance, uh, balance out. Uh, maintaining fences to not only keep your animals in, but, uh, but other animals um, out. You don't want your heifers going and visiting the neighbor's bull and then coming home. Group and cattle by age, there's a lot of advantages to this, not just for disease uh, control, but, but proper nutrition um, and management, keeping the environment as clean and dry as possible. Um, as I sit here in February and it's raining outside, um, easier said than done, uh, keeping equipment clean, if you are going to house um, animals indoors, making sure that we have really good ventilation. Minimizing wildlife contact. Again, some of these are much easier said than done. Uh, wild hogs is a big problem uh, for us, and they do ca carry things like brucellosis and pseudorabies that can impact cattle, uh, leptospirosis, same thing with white-tailed deer. Uh, protecting feed uh, from manure, urine, you know, rodents are a constant problem. Birds can be a very big problem. Um, and so we need to think about those things, even though they're, they're hard, we need to, to pay attention and do the best we can. Um, making sure you're paying attention to um, your breeding program and, and developing a disease-free breeding program, uh, buying virgin bulls, virgin heifers, um, evaluating a plan for visitors and vehicle traffic and equipment use. This becomes especially important if we have a foreign animal disease outbreak. It's, it's not something that you think about on a cow-calf operation where our cattle are housed outdoors. And again, sunlight and rain to wash away diseases um, really is a benefit for us when we have animals outside. Um, but we have to start being really careful if we have a foreign animal disease um, outbreak that we, um, we really tighten up. Um, so this is um, actually an aerial photo, satellite photo of um, the Hill Farm Research Station. And so if you're familiar with the Hill Farm Research Station, you've got beef cattle, you also have poultry, you have forestry, and you have all of these roads that go through here. And, and so from a day-to-day -day operation standpoint, you need to think about the cattle, you know, keeping young cattle um, away from other cattle. If, you know, cattle are coming in from Red River, making sure we quarantine those for a little bit before we, we put them in with, with calves from Hill Farm. But we're sharing these roads, and so you know the when when a you know one of the poultry houses needs to be emptied, you know it's going down the same road where cattle trailers are going, where um, you know uh, trucks hauling trees might be going. If we should have a foreign animal disease outbreak, what you need to have a plan for is okay. Do we need to shut some of these roads down, and will the you know, the state or the federal government actually come and shut some of these roads down for cattle. 
or for poultry, one or the other, but I still need to have business continuity for, for the other group. So if it's a d- disease that only impacts cattle, I still need to be able to do business as a, as the, with the poultry part of this operation. Um, same thing would go if you've got you know row crops or vegetables. So these are the types of things that we need to think about ahead of time. And you may need to bring in some resources and people that are even more expert than I am about, you know, what is the best way in case we do get something. But the more planning you do, the better off you're going to be to survive if um, we do have one of these outbreaks. So the, the BQA program now has a daily biosecurity plan. This is a template. It's a PDF that you can fill out. It asks all the questions that you should be asking yourself and to develop these plans. And and some of this you can answer yourself. Some of this would need to be done in um, concert with your veterinarian, but a really, really great resource because it makes, it's it's kind of dummy proof. You you know, even as a veterinarian, I may, may, uh, you know, miss some questions or not be thinking about the right things because, you know, there's a lot going on. Um, and this is a really great um, resource and you can find that um, at bqa.org um, under the resources tab. The other really good resource, and there's a lot there, but but you don't need to look at everything and that's a secure beef supply plan. So this was developed, there's a secure meat supply, beef supply plan, pork supply, milk, poultry. And this is really the next level after you have done your, you know, daily biosecurity plan is to look at um, a biosecurity plan in case we get a foreign animal disease um, outbreak. And again, making sure this prepares us the best we can be prepared. It is a continuity of business plan. So if, if you have these plans in place and a stop movement goes into effect and you've got calves that need to go to the sale or, or that have been contracted or whatever, you, you want to have the best chance possible of being able to continue to do business. And this is going to be um, one of those things um, to do, to have it already filled out because it, it just um, shows your commitment that you're, you're trying to do the best and you're, and you're prepared. So a little bit about spreading diseases to, um, to, from animals to people. There, so there are some diseases of cattle that we have to be really careful about that people can get Uh, Cryptosporidia is one that causes diarrhea in calves, but it can also cause um, severe diarrhea and weight loss in people, Um, salmonella, uh, tuberculosis. And so for the most part, if people have a healthy immune system, um, and particularly um, people that are on the farm, you know, all the time may have some immunity to these diseases. And these diseases are spread by the exact same modes of transmission that we already talked about through through um, with cattle. Um, and so again, livestock producers work with animals daily and may have some immunity um, to diseases. But if you're bringing visitors to farms, if you're bringing in new employees who've never been around livestock before, they have a higher risk and you wanna think about those things. And again, your veterinarian is not a physician, but they understand these diseases and they understand the risks. So you can always talk to them. Uh, Immunocompromised populations. So we have people that, you know, are on chemotherapy for cancer and they're on drugs that make them feel just fine and they go about their business. But we need to remember that they may be at higher risk for disease. They may be on steroids for you know, um, allergies or um, other immune system um, diseases, things like diabetes, anything, those, those diseases that make us more susceptible to, to COVID-19 or also make us more susceptible to all diseases. So we need to think about um, ourselves and we need to think about um, our employees and our visitors and, and protecting them. So in summary, uh, how do diseases get in? We are gonna, usually they're bought and uh, paid for is, is kind of a common thing that we talk about. So purchase cattle or cattle returning um, from a show, they might be diseased when you get them, they might be carriers, they might be in, incubating a disease. So you have to think about all of those. Other animals, pests, wildlife, people. So we wanna make sure that we don't spread those diseases, boots, clothing, hands, breathing, uh, you know, animals um, or uh, needles, so inanimate objects, trucks, equipment, um, and then contaminated feed and water. And then what do we do? These are just really basic 
and the details need to be worked out on your individual operation. But, you know, thinking about, okay, I'm buying a bull or I'm buying a group of heifers, what diseases that they could be carriers of, they look perfectly healthy when I look at them, but there are some diseases that they could bring into my herd. And that would be a uh, BBD, Yoni's, anaplasmosis would be the top three of those, but there may be others. <clears throat> if you have, if you're selling um, registered cattle, um, particularly if you have any export market, then things like um, bovine leukemia virus might be something you want to keep out of your herd. Um, don't buy pregnant unless BVD free herd or plan to test because though that fetus can bring in, in BVD and there's not a good way to test um, for that. Um, don't buy open females unless they're virgin. That's, a, a, um, that's to keep trichomoniasis out of our herds. Um, buy only virgin bulls. Again, that's to, to keep trichomoniasis out. Uh, quarantining new arrivals, quarantining animals returning from a show, avoiding fence line contact with neighbors, keeping good fences. And then um, another thing is, you know, if you're going to spend the money to collect embryos or do IVF, uh, you want to have really good recips and, and raising your own recips is a, is a much lower than, than buying recips. So that's all I have. I think I um, have to thank again, Dr. Julia Herman um, with the Beef Quality Assurance um, NCBA the um, Center for Food Security and Public Health, they were the ones who um, put together the Secure Bee Supply Plan, which is, is really, really critical for us if we're going to survive. Um, and it's critical to our overall economy. We, if we get one of these diseases, it's, it's not going to just impact the animal agriculture um, sectors of our, um, our economy. And uh, as usual, you know how to get in touch with me um, through any of your county agents. And if I can ever answer any questions for you or help you uh, in any way with any animal health uh, problems or planning prevention, uh, all you have to do is contact me. Thank you.